At a local well-known hot pot restaurant in Chongqing City, a man pulled a whole mouse from the hot pot they served him. The incident has attracted media attention. As the Chinese Communist Party gave up the stringent zero-COVID policy, harsh measures like mass testing and quarantine were abandoned. Even related keywords to such efforts have been grayed out on Chinese social media, but Chinese netizens are unhappy about it. Is the employment situation getting more and more severe? The CCP might not correctly answer this question, but many Chinese internet users do, and what they say could be what's happening in China now. Meanwhile, economic expert says China's economic growth rate is expected to be only 2.5 percent in the next 10 years. In late February, China released a 12-point peace plan titled The Political Settlement of the Ukraine Crisis. However, expert says it is actually about Taiwan. A mainland netizen recently complained on the internet that when eating at a popular local hot pot restaurant, he found a whole boiled mouse with its skin partially peeled off in one of the hot dishes. The incident then attracted media attention. According to reports from many mainland media, on March 5th, Mr. Bei, pseudonym, told the media that he had a meal at a restaurant in Julongpo, Chongqing, and picked out a whole mouse from the hot pot. The restaurant owner ordered him to delete the post. The Market Supervision Bureau is currently investigating the incident. Mr. Bei said, When I caught it again, I felt something was wrong. When I picked it up, it turned out to be a whole mouse. I couldn't bear it at the time and rushed to the toilet to vomit. The hot pot restaurant in question is a well-known Chongqing restaurant serving beef offal hot pot, a specialty of the Sichuan Chongqing region. Considering that he and his friends wanted to go to the hospital for a checkup as soon as possible, Mr. Bay was offered compensation at 10 times the average amount. The owner's attitude seemed wrong, so Mr. Bay reported the matter to the Market Supervision Bureau. The shop owner refused to provide the footage when the police and staff of the Market Supervision Bureau arrived, claiming that the camera was malfunctioning that day. As Chinese media Xi Wang Zhizhang reported, the first session of the CCP 14th National People's Congress opened on March 4th. Chinese netizens have suddenly discovered that large-scale PCR testing has been grayed out on the Chinese internet, and the subject is alleged to violate relevant laws and regulations. Some netizens accused the CCP of being shameless, trying to erase the disaster period after they imposed extreme COVID measures on the Chinese. On March 4th, the hashtag large-scale PCR testing did not show any results on Weibo. It was said to violate relevant laws, regulations, and policies instead. Many people's comments were cited by Shi Wang Zhishang as follows. The PCR testing topic is grayed out. Those who have experienced it will never forget. They will never forget the lockdown and having to listen to ambulances and police cars every day. They will never forget all the absurd things caused by the extreme pandemic prevention policy. The past three years will never be forgotten. Another said, this is still no apology or anyone taking responsibility for the pandemic measure's consequences. Someone commented, the bus accident in Guizhou, the fire in Xinjiang were caused by the wrong pandemic prevention policy. People who were already dead might not rest in peace. The existence of those who trample on them hindered the country's development. Another called out, speak up even if you're forced to be silenced. Speak up even if your account gets blown. We're humans, not pigs lying down waiting to die. According to the Jiangsu Provincial Committee, on March 2nd, Wushu City, Jiangsu Province, held a COVID-related personal data destruction ceremony. The first batch of 1 billion data pieces was destroyed. A third-party notary and audit office were invited to participate to ensure the data was completely destroyed and couldn't be restored. This news is trending on Weibo. Chinese netizens believe the CCP is destroying its despicable history with PCR test fraud evidence. Many people spoke up regarding the news. The leaks are all fake nucleic acid test results. Are they trying to erase their criminal evidence as soon as possible? Data can be destroyed, but painful memories and crimes cannot be erased. A netizen found some previous photos to reminisce about the tearful years. This photo shows the daily nucleic acid testing. People still had to line up for nucleic acid testing late at night. After many months of being locked down, people didn't have the opportunity to use their bicycles. They could just be seen abandoned under dry leaves.
On the Jihu website in China, recently someone asked, "Is the employment situation getting more and more severe?" So far, nearly 900 responses have been accumulated, most of which are "yes," collected by Chinese overseas media on International Women's Day, March 8th. One user posted that even prisoners are losing their jobs in large numbers. Another said, "Freelancers don't even have jobs, let alone others." Another user said that she wanted to join Tai Yuan Foxconn, but a friend of hers at Fox. Foxconn said they only recruited 200 people out of 3,000 participants. She said she no longer understood the concept of this recruitment. Another said that three years ago he was accepted into the unit as a student without a university degree. Now the ones who got into his unit are masters. A netizen reported a few days ago, the city's human resources and social security department held a job fair. Before it started, there were a lot of people outside, afraid such a busy image of job seekers will show the unit's poor performance. The security guard let some people in and then closed the office. In addition to the Jihu website, domestic short video platforms such as Douyin also show the difficult situation of finding a job. Since the Chinese New Year, the internet has been flooded with videos complaining about the difficulty of finding a job. Jiangsu, Shixiang, and Guangdong were places where there used to be a developed manufacturing industry. In a recent video, hundreds of thousands of migrant workers came here but could not find jobs and had to return home by car. One user concluded, "All." All I can say is that anyone still talking about the employment situation at this time is an optimist. More and more experts point out that China's economic growth slowdown is inevitable. Recently, Ru Qi Sharma, chairman of Rockefeller International, predicted that China's economic growth would only be about 2.5 percent in the next 10 years. In an interview, he said China's rapid growth in the past 40 years has encountered a bottleneck. The leadership of the Communist Party of China is about to face a real test. On March 5th, Chinese authorities unveiled a growth target of around 5%. However, it did not indicate how much fiscal stimulus there would be. Sharma said, "I don't think the numbers are very meaningful in the long run, given the demographics, debt, and the headwinds of deglobalization. I think China is lucky to grow at 2.5%." Before Sharma, there were also many economists predicting China's economic growth. Last October, the BlackRock Investment Institute warned of a downturn in China's long. Long-term outlook. Sonali Jain Chandra, chair of the International Monetary Fund China Program, said that the IMF has become more pessimistic about China's long-term prospects. The forecast for 2028 was revised down by more than one percentage point, decelerating to just 3.4 percent in 2028. In late February, China released a 12-point peace plan titled "The Political Settlement of the Ukraine Crisis." The plan is an announcement of China's stance in the Ukraine war. However, according to Craig Singleton, a senior China fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, the plan could be more than that. In a recent foreign policy commentary, he suggested that it is actually about Taiwan. Craig argued that China's plan might potentially be the cornerstone of a Western-led strategy to avert an Indo-Pacific conflict in the first place. Moreover, it could provide the legal and rhetorical framework if Xi Jinping decides to invade Taiwan. Firstly, the plan calls on Western countries to give up their Cold War mentality and avoid block confrontation. Craig wrote that these phrases implied NATO's help to the Ukrainian government. In other words, China does not want to see the presence of the U.S. and its European allies in the Ukraine war. Beijing's attempt to prevent the intervention of the free world could be a significant factor if the Cross Straits war happens. If Taiwan receives the same help as the Ukraine, then China is unlikely to gain the upper hand. Secondly, another point that reflects China's concern in a future contingency is the demand to keep industrial and supply chains stable. Craig gives an example of China's mild reaction to American semiconductor import limits. Given China's reliance on Western technology and markets, Beijing is concerned that causing equal harm to the U.S. could be counterproductive. Beijing intends to exert influence over Western decisions regarding Taiwan, not the other way around, by tying itself to global value networks in ways that Moscow could never. Thirdly, Craig addresses China's other two priorities: ceasing hostilities and respecting the sovereignty of all countries. 
Though China cannot justify Russia's infringement of Kyiv's sovereignty, the priorities would help it maintain its supposition about Taiwan on the world stage. It could happen partly due to the unlawful exclusion of Taiwan from the UN system while the West adheres to its version of the One China policy. Without legit recognition among the international network, Taiwan's legal recourse could be limited following an invasion.